mostly. The start time is E, 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 finish time. Either you join.
All right, let's get started. To refresh where we were last time, we were talking about depth first search. Um, actually, initially, we were talking about explore algorithm uh, on undirected graphs. So uh, there's this little tidbit. And it would explore starting from a vertex. During that explore, it would visit everything in the connected component of that vertex uh, and give us this kind of DFS tree that marked the, the um, order and the structure of the exploration. And we saw how this uh, algorithm solves the, prob the reachability problem of determining, um, given a vertex, every, uh, w whether other vertices are reachable from it, there's a path to them or not. Um, then we went to, we extended this algorithm into something called depth first search. Depth first search reused the same explore routine, but had an outer loop, which made sure that in the end of the day, every vertex was visited. So we explored from some initial vertex and it explored that connected component. But then when it's done, you'd come back out and you'd find something else that wasn't visited and explore from there. And in that way, you could, ex you could run DFS on a graph like this, and you would actually visit all the vertices, even, if, even in different connected components. And so this algorithm was uh, linear in time, so uh, ran in theta n plus m time. And uh, you know, the first thing we used it for was to solve this connected uh, this connectivity problem to label each vertex with its connected component, like, like we did here. Okay. And that was basically just running DFS with these extra three lines in it uh, to maintain the counter for the current connected component. Um, okay. Um, so where we pick up today is... Um, uh, so we're, we're going we're gonna to look forward to try to solve another problem. This other problem is uh, um, following. Given a directed graph G, determine if it has a cycle. We'll talk more about this problem, about its applications, uh, but uh, and it will turn out that this will be solved with depth first search, another small modification of depth first search. Okay, but we need to before we get to that point, we need to intro introduce a few more things, and that's what we'll do this lecture. The first thing we'll do is add a ticking clock. to our DFS. And I'll explain uh, with an example in a, in a minute, but um, what we wanna do is mark the time a vertex V was discovered Call this pre V. Discovered, I mean, the first time it was visited, the first time we called explore on it. And we want to mark the time the vertex uh, was uh, was um, wrapped up. So this is called post V. Wrapped up, I mean the explore function, i.e. explore call ended. So let's, let's look at an example. Uh, let's use our favorite example, this one.
Okay, so um, remember how we were visiting, uh, how we were going, running DFS on this graph. I'll go through it a little faster this time since we've already done it once. We start with a visit to A, with exploring A. Now we put a one there. This is the first tick of the clock. Um, then after A, we go to B, and now we put a two there. Now at B, notice we don't make any recursive call. So we, we actually, we wrap up, we, our explore call ends. So the clock ticks and we put a three. The idea is that we never reuse a number once. So we, once we put a number down, we, the, we add one to the current time. Okay. So we are done with uh, B, we go back to A, but we're still exploring A, we're not done with it. We go to E, so we go to E, so we explore it. Uh, it's now time four. Then from E, we go to I, now it's time five. From I, we go to J, and now it's time six. But J, again, nowhere further to go. So we wrap up, put a seven, we go back up to I. Now I, we're also done. We're gonna wrap up there. We're gonna put an eight. We're gonna go to E. E, we're also done. And finally, A, A, we're also done. So, yeah, so in this example, remember we fixed, we said that the order of the vertices is defined alphabetically. Now, if it was defined somehow else, then this search and the numbers would look different. So if, if for example, when we were at E, we didn't go to I first, but we went instead to J first, then the numbers would have looked different and that's fine. So that given a f uh, ordering of the vertices, your numbers will look the same. Right. When we're done with exploring A, remember we go out to the outer loop. So we go, you know, we explored A here. We're done with that. So we go to the next vertex that's not visited and we explore that. In this case, we go to well, B is explored, so we go to C. We start exploring it, 11, then we go to D, that's 12. Then we go to H, 13. Then from H, we go to G, 14. And from G, we go to K, 15. We wrap up K, so 16. We wrap up G, so 17. Then when we go to H, notice we don't wrap it up because we have, uh, we have L to visit. So we're gonna actually visit L. And our time is now 18. So we discover L at 18. We wrap it up right away, 19. We go up to H. We now wrap up H, 20. And we go wrap up everything else. Uh, What's the only thing that's left unexplored is F. So we explore F, the time is 23, and we wrap, wrap it up right away, 23. Okay. Any questions about these numbers? We'll see how they're really useful. Uh, uh, later in this lecture. Um, for now, I want to make an observation. Um, about if we view these, if we view these uh, start and finish times as intervals, right, intervals on a timeline, how can two intervals 
of vertices intersect. What I mean is, okay, you have interval of A and interval of B. Notice that B, the interval two, three, is contained in the interval one to 10. Right? So you can, uh, this is one to 10, A, then B is two to three. So B interval is contained in A. What about L and A? They're disjoint. They're disjoint. So L is somewhere here, 18, 19, that's L. You pick any two other ones, say D and G. You'll always notice that either one is contained in the other or they're disjoint. And that, that's not a coincidence. And that's the property, the observation that I want to uh, write down. For all vertices U and V, the two intervals. The first interval is pre U, we'll write it like this, post U. And pre V and post V. Are either disjoint. Or one is contained. in the other. And the reason uh, is uh, basically, um, it's due to the last in, I'll write it first and then explain it. Last in, first out behavior, the recursive call stack. These intervals that we're assigning are in some real sense, they're times. They're, they're the time that explore, let's say you, explore, uh, let's say, let's take uh, E. Four nine. This is the time that Explorer E's call was on the call side, was active. That that function was running. So it's not like sure, it's not uh, you know clock time like from that kind of clock, but it's 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 a it's time in the sense of uh, rel relatively speaking, this captures when E Explorer E was first called and when it was terminated. All these times then capture when the corresponding explore functions were called. Now, if you just imagine how, I mean, these are all recursive calls. It's some kind of recursive tree. So um, if, if you call explore u, then if explore V is called during that time, while we are still in explore U, if explore V is called, then it's got to finish before explore U finishes. You can't, I can't have a function like explore U starts, then it calls explore V, explore V runs, keeps on running, but explore U finishes. That's not possible. Explore V has to finish first in order for Explore U to finish. That's the intuition behind uh, why one should be contained in the other. The only other possibility is that they are called, um, the only other possibility is that 
use explore call totally finishes before we begin v's explore call. So in that case, the intervals are disjoint. Again, so let's say you're calling explore u. If explore v is called while you're still running, then it's going to finish before you're done. Otherwise, v would be the other possibility is v is going to be explored after you are done exploring. And that's the case of the disjoint control. What this eliminates is, uh, so something like this is not possible. The intervals that intersect like this is not possible in this case. Any questions? Okay, yeah. I did jump from 17 on G to 18 on L. Good. So if you remember, we were start exploring from C, we went down like this, we are done with K. We came up with done with G, so that's time 17. Then we go to H. At H, we still have another neighbor we need to visit. And that's when we visit L. And so we discover L at time 18. That's how it went from 17 on G to 18 on L. We don't, the thing is when we go from G to H, we're not calling explore H. We're just backtracking up the call stack. Explore H was called earlier on at time 13. And we went, and now we're backing up. So when we're, so we're not, we're back up to H. We don't mark it as anything until we're actually done with that call altogether. Other questions? Okay. Mm. So um, we need some terminology um, before we go forward. Um, I'll put it using this tree as an example. So um, these nodes, this is called the root. The, the root of the tree is the first node. Then um, we say that K is a descendant of uh, D, for example, or that D is an ancestor of K. So D is an ancestor of K or the opposite K is a descendant of D. That's because formally it's because they lie on, on the same path to the root. Right. You can, I mean, it's really intuitive just to think of it like a family tree. Uh, that's where the metaphor coming from. Um, notice that K and L are not descendants or ancestors. This is an important point. K is not a descendant of L, just like you're not a descendant of your aunt. You're a descendant, of, you're, you're both are descendants of your, let's say, grandmother, but you're not a descendant of your aunt, and your aunt is not your ancestor. You also have the notion of a child and a parent. So uh, K is a child of G, and G is a parent of K. It's the immediate relationship. So uh, K is a child of G. K is not a K is not a child of H. Just like you're not the child of your grandfather. Any question about the, the terminology?
Okay, so with that being said, let's look at what happens when we run depth first search in directed graphs. Remember, we're all we're eventually trying to get to solve this problem of finding cycles in directed graphs. Having those numbers we'll see in the pre and post visit numbers help. And um, the other thing is we need to understand what happens depth for search on, on um, directed graphs. The, the answer is it's very simple. Like it's the same, the exact same algorithm. Um, the only thing that really where we look at the edges is here. So for each edge, V, U. Before, like here, we would look for A, we would look at all its neighbors, B and E. Now in a directed graph, we're only going to look at the out neighbors, so the edges coming out of A. Let's see an example. I'll take one from the book. Okay, so um, we um, explore only the out neighbor. The out neighbors. So, for example, the uh, out neighbors of A. Are B, C. I need to change the mic. Yeah, so the out neighbors of A are B, C, and F, but not what's not an out neighbor of A? D, D. D is not an out neighbor of A because there's no edge from A to D. There's just an edge from D to A, and that's not the same thing. Okay, so let's just see how DFS will work on this, uh, on this example. We start, again, we'll assume a, a alphabetical order of the vertices, so we'll start with A. Uh, that explore time will be one. And we'll go to B. By the way, we'll keep track of our, keep track of the tree we build or the forest. Um, all right, so from B, we go to E, right? Because that's the only out neighbor, it's E. B, I should have said we started time two, and E, we started time three. Now from E, we have several choices. We have F, G, and H. F, G, and H, so we take the one with the smallest. Uh, alphabetic order, which is F. We mark it as having started four. From F, we only have, well, we have 
out neighbor B and G, but B has already been visited. So we go to G, the market is being started. Let's move this out of the way. Okay. Um, from G, notice G has no out neighbors. So we wrap up G, we go back up to F. We've now visited all the neighbors of F, all the out neighbors, so we wrap it up. We go to E, but from E, we now still have an out neighbor that we haven't visited, it's H. So what was our, what's our clock? Uh, last clock was F at seven. We finished F at seven, and now we put H eight. We add H to the bottom of E. Actually, going to draw these as directed edges right, because that's the, in this case the direction. I want to say a couple of things. So one, notice with the with the ticking clock, it 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 ticks only when necessary. So in other words, we we'll get to the end. We'll have like the, like up till now we have eight. Uh, we've we've had some event happen at every time point. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, something. There's, that number is marked somewhere. And so we, we, we only increment the clock after we mark it. That's, that's my point. Um, so that's why this was a seven. And even though we went up and did all this, the next time point is still an eight. But now we can wrap up at H, so that's nine. We can wrap up at three, that's 10. Sorry, we can wrap up at E, that's 10. We go up to B, that's wrapped up at 11. And A, A we don't wrap up because from A, we can now explore C. So that starts at time 12. Um, did I miss? Good. All right. So at C, we start at 12, and then we go to D. D is 13. I should be also putting here that I went to C, and from C, I went to D. And from D, now I have all my neighbors have been visited. I have nowhere to go next. So I wrap it up. I put 14 here. I go back up. I wrap up C. I put 15. And I wrap up A and I put 16. Yeah. Yeah, when we go back up, we're going against the edges because we're this is going up the recursive call stack to explore you. Okay, so this is called a DFS search tree. For some, it's just a minor terminology thing, but in a in a in the director graph, we'll call it a search tree. Um, of course. Because a forest is technically undirected, but the way it looks is essentially the same. Um, we'll, we'll, in fact, even sometimes still call it a forest. So it's not an important distinction, but I do want to introduce this term since you might see it in the book. Um, so uh, let's take all the edges now that we did not put into the tree. And let's put them in as dotted edges. So for example, from A to F, there's an edge. Uh, let's put A to F. And then from uh, D to A, there's an edge. Also from D to H, there's an edge. 
from H to G, there's an edge. From E to G, there's an edge. And from F to B, there's an edge. I think that got it all. So the this on the right, if we consider the graph with all the dotted edges, it's exactly the same graph as here. It just we it's drawn differently, but it's exactly the same vertices and exactly the same edges once we consider these guys. So now I want to characterize the edges in my graph according to how they look like in this tree. Okay. I'll do it through example first. This, this is a tree edge. And that's simple enough. So tree edge is a, an edge that's in the tree. Um, right, so C to D is a tree edge. You can write it here as well, tree edge. It's the one we colored in yellow. Okay. So let, let's write this a little more formally. Let F be the DFS search tree or forest. Um, an edge B is classified as follows. So one, if UV is in the forest, then it's called a tree edge. Um, now let's look at the other kinds of edges. That's gonna be more interesting. So D to A, D to A, is called a backward edge. D to A is called a backward edge. Backward edge is defined as, first of all, not in the forest, so it's not a tree edge, and that V, uh, let me be careful here, V, is an ancestor of you. This is a back edge. Excuse me, it shouldn't be backward edge, it should be back edge. So here, for example, DA, this would be U, and this would be V. Right? This would be when when we're applying the definition, we would think of D of U as being D and uh, V as being A. So that would say, okay, D A is not in the forest, and A is an ancestor of D. Which, if you look at the forest, that's that's the case. Are there other edges in here? Can you identify other edges that fit the definition of a back edge? Does e, EG fit the definition of a back edge? Point. Yeah. F to B would be indeed a back edge. F, F to B would be a back edge. be a back edge. Good, because F to B, it's not a, it's, it's not in the forest, it's, it's not yellow, it's not dashed, and B, uh, B is an ancestor of F. So F to B, it's going up, this dot edge is going up the tree on the path to the root. Another way to think of it. 
Okay, there's another one. Uh, wait, are there any other back edges before I continue? I don't think so. Okay, so the other the next edge is the opposite of a backward edge of a back edge, which is a forward edge. So it's an edge that's not in the forest and uh, V is a non-child ancestor of you. And that's a forward edge. Oh, excuse me, not ancestor, the opposite, this, this, descendant. Descendant. Non child descendant of you. So, um, so it's going down in the tree. For example, a to F is a forward edge. A to F is a forward edge. Well, because it's not a it's not a tree edge, and F is a descendant of A. Right. Unchild descendant. Are there other forward edges in here? Yeah. E? How many of you think E to G is a forward edge? How many are not sure? So how would we check? Okay, F to, which one was it? E to G? E, G. Is it a forward edge? Well, we just have to check these conditions. So is it in the forest? Uh, no, we didn't color it in yellow. We didn't, it's not a dash, so it's not in the forest. Okay, and now we have to check V is a non-descendant of, non-child descendant of U. So here, G plays the role of V and E plays the role of U. So is V, sorry, is G a non-child descendant of U? G is, in fact, a non-child descendant of, of U or E in this case. That's a forward edge. E to G is a forward edge. Uh, what about D to H? How many of you think this is a forward edge? How many of you think this is a back edge? How many of you think that it's not either of those? Okay. So those are, that's correct. It's neither of those. Because if you look at D and H, it's like that example I made earlier that you're not a descendant of your aunt. It's the same thing here. If you look at the path of H to the root, you don't hit D anywhere. So it's like the, this, the ancestors of H are E, are B, are A, but that's it. So none of these conditions hold. That brings us to the fourth type of edge, which is U and V is not an F and not a back edge and not a forward edge. So all the other edges. This is a cross edge, cross edge, kind of going across different subtrees. Yeah. Um,
That's a good question. Uh, um, let me get back to you. That's an interesting uh, point. Um, I don't see the reason now to specify, but the fact that it's in the definition makes me think that there is a some special case where it's important. Okay, so there. What are the cross edges here? We've got this one. Um, let's get rid of that. So D and H is a cross edge. Are there other cross edges here? Yeah. Is H and G a cross edge? How many of you think it's a cross edge? How many of you are not sure? So it is a cross edge because H and G are not descendants of each other. Right. Okay, so this, all we've done here is just given a characterization to each of the edges in our graph in terms of how it looks like in the tree. Now, we do, um, Wait a second. By the way, your book, uh, book has a uh, typo and figure typo is missing edge. I'll be specific missing edge in figure 3.7. It's this one. Uh, yeah, I forgot which one there, but it's uh, one of the edges is uh, was missing. Maybe it's fixed in a later edition of the book. I'm not sure. Um, okay. Now, where this is all headed is I'm going to. Uh, um, just kind of jump ahead. It turns out that a graph has a cycle if and only if after running a DFS, there's a back edge. We'll prove that after the midterm, but just to peek ahead of why we're doing all this, it turns out this like edge characterization is very interesting. Oh, well, very useful. So the it's it's going to be important to to check whether what type of edge something is. Now the way we've defined it is in terms of this DFS search tree, but the depth first search algorithm actually doesn't build a tree like it itself. It it it, it doesn't create any data structure for a tree. This is all it does, right? The tree is sort of it's implicit. It's the way we analyze it. But all the DFS does is does these explorations and writes down these pre and post numbers. So, so given that, it's not clear how one checks if there's a forward edge. If like, uh, how do I check the DNA, what type of edge it is? I can check if it's a tree edge just by you know, remembering which edges I explored along, that's easy enough. That's what's in yellow here. But to see if the paths in the forest and search tree, uh, that's not clear because we didn't build this tree. The really neat thing is it turns out we don't need this tree to determine whether something is a back edge or not, or in general, the type of edge it is. We can do it just by looking at this, these intervals. That's what I'm going to explain now, how to make the connection between edge type and the intervals on UV. And then we'll, we will be able to define an edge classification without referring to the actual structure of the forms. So um, we already observed about how 
if you have an edge uv, what can happen to its intervals? We're just going to do it a little more detail now. So one thing we can do, uh, uh, this is just to get the intuition, is we can think about um, these intervals as being open and closed parentheses. So, for example, like in, in our in our case here, we could just think of us oh, like a. We start we start exploring a. We write down parentheses open a, and then we go to b and we write down parentheses open b. We go to e parentheses open e. We go to f. We go to g. And then we go back up. So we're done with G. So we close the parentheses G. And then we close the parentheses F because we're done with exploring F. We go up to E. From E, remember, we're still exploring. We go to H. So we open parentheses H. And we right away close that parentheses. We go back up to E. We close E. We go up to close B. Then we go A, but we are still exploring A, and then we open C, and so on. Okay. It's another way of thinking about how about these uh, pre and post numbers. But the parentheses gives you a nice intuition because parentheses um, they they're nested, right? Just the way we use them in the English language. We can't have uh, you can't have um, something like uh, open A, open C, close A, close C. So that's, that's not possible, just intuitively the way parentheses works. And, and what the observation we made earlier that two intervals are either disjoint or one is contained in the other. Okay, that, that observation is what tells us these things, this behaves like these prints. Okay, so it's just a way to um, get some intuition for what, what might happen. Now, um, uh, let's take a, let's take a, um, Uh, let me make, let me write down my claim. So claim, uh, claim, we can determine edge type through pre and post labels for the intervals. Okay. So let me, your book has a nice demonstration uh, the, uh, table with this. Let me just copy it. Okay. So, um, Is that fine for you guys in the back? Seems not too small. Okay. Um, so let's get some intuition again. Uh, let's take a back edge. Um, let's take a back edge. So back edge D A. Uh, for D A, our intervals are. Uh, D is 13, 14. So this is uh, D is 13, 14. And A is 1, 16. So if we now remember this is will be U, V. So we can say in terms of parentheses that uh, you have 
well, we can write A open, D open, D close, and A close. Or in terms of UV, we would write V open, U open, U close, V close. In other words, this is all a fancy way of saying that uh, D's interval is contained in A, or in terms of UV, U's inter interval is contained in V. And this takes us to one of the cases in this table. In particular, here's U's, here's U, here's V. No, excuse me, uh, U is contained in V, so it's actually, this is U here and this is V here. This is the case of the back edge. Before, what we said was that two intervals, they're going to be here either disjoint or one contained in the other. We're now splitting that second category further into two. So one, we'll say that they're disjoint. So here, this is the case where V open close, U open close. This might be small. Let me make that bigger. Uh, be big enough? Um, these are the cases. So here you've got their disjoint. So these intervals and use intervals are disjoint. And in this case, we can be sure that it's a cross edge. If use interval is contained in these interval, then it's a back edge. And if it's the other way around, if, if these interval is contained in use interval, then it's either a tree or forward edge. We can tell from like now using that table, when we look at the edge DA, even if we didn't have, let's say we didn't have any of this, right? And we didn't write down this information here. We just looked at DA and we looked at these numbers. Right? We could tell from that because D is contained in A that this is a back edge. That's what, that's what this gives us. We could tell if we were to ask about D and H, we could tell the type of edge by looking at these intervals and saying these are disjoint intervals. So this is a cross edge, disjoint intervals. The, yeah. Because what? Because 13, 14 is inside of 116. Like I'm, I'm thinking of this as, as like, a, here's, oh, here's one, oh, here's A's interval, it's one and 16. And D's interval was, oops, 116 A, and D's interval was uh, 13 and 14. So B's interval is contained in A's interval. Does that make sense? But if we you know, think of it in terms of the parentheses, this is open parentheses. This is like, so B's parentheses are inside of A's parentheses. You, it's, this, it's two different ways of thinking about the exact same thing. You can think about just, you can forget about the parentheses and you can just say one interval is contained in another or you can think about parentheses open and close and saying which parentheses are inside and which are outside. Yeah. No, it could be the other way around. It could be the, the, the V here and the U here could be swapped. It's just that they're disjoint. Other questions? So um, the other thing we haven't seen is a forward edge. So a forward edge is the opposite of a backward edge. So 
here A would contain the interval of F. So the edge from U to V, the U would contain the interval of V. We go here, U contains the interval of V. And that's either a tree edge or a forward edge. So this, the, here we don't know if it's tree or forward just from the intervals, but here it just helps that we wrote down, marked in yellow, what were the edges along which we explored. Let, let's, uh, good question. I'll get back to that in a second. Other, other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So DE, if we were to just look at the numbers, uh, D and E, they're disjoint. So 310 is disjoint with 1314. So we would be mistaken in saying there is a cross edge. The trick is here that this classification only works when, when there's an edge. So that's like, you can classify an edge. It doesn't work the other way around. If you have two vertices with, with uh, these uh, types of overlaps, then if there's no edge between them, there's no edge. You can't conclude that there's an edge. Uh, so yeah, about the question about the undirected graph. So if you remember, a long, 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 long time ago, maybe a week or so, we talked about uh, back edge in a so in an undirected graph. I can't find it in the notes. Here. Uh, Not even a week ago. Um, for undirected graph, we define tree edges and back edges, and that's it. So here, tree edges were, you know, the tree edges, and the back edges were uh, everything else. Now, it's just a different definition for an undirected graph, but you can see why. There's no. This is not a forward or backward edge, you can't distinguish it because it doesn't have a direction. And in terms of a cross edge, this is a more complicated uh, observation, but you, it's impossible to have an edge like this in an undirected graph. So we're not gonna go into details why, but, but it's not possible. So there is a, connection between a non-direct case, you don't have, you can't have those cross edges and the forward and backward edges, they're just called back edges because there's no way to distinguish them. Um, in a directed graph, we have the four edge types. Other questions? Yeah, so the question is, if it's possible to have both, uh, like A and F, to have both a backward edge and a forward edge between them. So an edge from A to F and from F to A. Um, well, actually this definition tells us no, because, uh, let's hold it. No, I take it back. Uh, this, I think it is, I think it might be possible. Not 100% sure, but I, I think it might be possible. Questions? There are no questions I can end early. How many are kind of, are comfortable with this edge classification? 
Okay, so maybe we can end early then. Thank you.